BHP Billiton. Um, we've got, uh, you have their biographies in front of you, but we have uh, J.P. Gladu, who is the President and CEO of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. We then have uh, Mr. James Ensor, who's come all the way from Australia, who's the Group Senior Manager for Social Policy for BHP Billiton. Then we have uh, Mr. Sam Woods, who's the uh, Business Development and Government Affairs Manager for the Navajo Transitional Energy Company, who's come in from New Mexico to be with us. And then we have uh, Mr. Emmanuel Boulay, who's come all the way from New York Avenue. Uh, and he's the Principal Environmental Specialist, Environmental and Social Safeguards Division of the Inter-American Development Bank to provide a multilateral development bank perspective. I think we've got the right group of people for this discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to my new friend, Mr. Gladu. JP. No, just you can do it from there. Wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. So what I wanted to do is uh, set the context of the organization of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, uh, the context of uh, Aboriginal people in Canada, and, uh, and, and the sort of the, the past, the current, and the future when it comes to the new reality of Aboriginal business and, and the relationships uh, between Canada's indigenous people and, uh, and the resource sector, particularly the mining. I'll try, and, I'll try and stay focused on that as much as I can. Just to, uh, so Aboriginal, uh, it is an umbrella term for Inuit, First Nations, and Métis. I'll flip-flop between Indigenous as well, and we're recognized in Canada's constitution. So our organization was founded by Murray Koffler about 30 years ago, and he was the founder of Shoppers Drug Mart, and it's, it's similar, it's akin to um, uh, Walgreens, so it's a substantial uh, company. And when Mr. Koffler came out of one of his stores in Calgary, he recognized that Canada's Indigenous people were not in a great state. And we, we've, we've struggled, but we've made some significant advances si since then. So 30 years ago, he challenged the government at the time, said, we need to do something about this. And um, they really didn't do a whole lot, so Mr. Koffler said, okay, I'm going to do something. So we started the uh, CCAB. Now, what sort of... Canada's uh, national sport, do you know what it is? You might think it's hockey, but actually, hockey. but it's not, although we're pretty good at it. You guys are very good at it. It's actually lacrosse. It's an indigenous game, but Canada's other sport for a very long time has been ping pong. And the way this game has been operating, we've got the federal paddle on this side and we've got the provincial paddles like this. And you can guess who's in the middle. And for the longest time, because we're the fiduciary responsibility, and by the way, I'm Anishinaabe from Northern Ontario, so I am indigenous from Canada. The way this game has gone is when we wanted to do something in our territories, which is akin to BLM lands here in the United States, uh, we go to the feds and the feds will say, well, listen, uh, you're, that's the provincial territory, so across the table we go. And we go to the provinces, hey, we want to do some resource activities, we've got some partnerships, we want to do something, and the provinces, well, other side of the table, you're actually the fiduciary responsibility of the federal government. So this game has been going on for a very long time, and uh, I don't know, I kind of got dizzy, and I think my ancestors are getting kind of dizzy. <laughs> but the point is that industry, corporate Canada, is starting to uh, wise up that this is a terrible game to play, because they're sitting on the sidelines, and they're going, where's this ball landing? And you know, the role of government sometimes is to manage their liabilities, but when you're looking at your butt half the time, you're not actually looking forward to where the opportunities are. And, and Canada being a, a very strong, uh, natural resource rich country, when we talk especially about mining, um, there is so much opportunity. So the, gov the industry has said, okay, enough of this game. So we, they're starting to come to the table now, and they're creating viable, long-term, sustainable business relationships with our communities. Uh, it's also been driven because we've had uh, over 200 court cases that have landed in the favor of our people. We've won over 90% of the court cases that we've entered into. So we've got a lot of political and legal clout now, and now we're starting to develop the business savvy. And the opportunity to partner with industry is, is, is being embraced by a lot of communities, not all communities. And, and the other thing you have to realize, we have over 633 nations across the country, 52 different languages. Uh, we have Inuit, we have Métis, so it's, you can't paint it with one brush, so I want to just give you the broad overview. So for the longest time, our people were very much interested in jobs, and then we were interested in uh, business and part of the supply chain to make sure that we're at the table participating on, in the economy. And now we're actually becoming partners on many of the resource projects, extraction, primary producers or partners with many of the companies across the country. The more progressive companies like, um, like Cameco and BHP, for instance, um, are some of the major uh, employers of our people and they also um, uh, 
provide a lot of contract opportunities to our communities in trucking and drilling and so on. Like there isn't a sector that our people don't participate in. So much so that in 2006 there was a census that was done, there was the last one, uh, that were 37,000 Aboriginal businesses. So this is about empowering our people through business. And if you can think of a number in your head of what you think the Aboriginal GDP, now mind you, Canada is about 33 or 34 million people, and our people represent about 4.5% of that. Um, we are contributing $32 billion to Canada's economy. $13 billion of that is actually coming from our people, and that's because of business. And when you empower a people through business, you're actually adding to the bottom line of your country. And if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're not, then you look at the balance sheet of our people, uh, and traditionally, and there's still these systemic barriers where we've got the highest edu education, uh, unemployment, infant mortality, and the list goes on and on. Those are a red mark on your country. And so Canada really, and we, we're still trying to step up the game. Now back to the mining resource sector. There isn't a piece of land that the resource sector uh, touches in Canada that is not going to impact one or two or three or a dozen of our native or indigenous communities. So it's in the best interest of corporate Canada to sit down and get to the table to talk about business. Because what happens when they don't, and there are many cases of this in Canada, it disrupts projects. And when you disrupt projects, uh, it costs companies money, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars every day if a project is blocked because our people have a lot of political clout and there's no reason that we should be going down that road. So it's about investing in relationships, it's about investing in business relationships. Um, let's see, what else can I address um, from, a, from an industry perspective? Um, I think some of the challenges that, and we also do a lot of research in-house, a lot of the challenges, because we've been on a forced hiatus as Indigenous people in Canada for a very long time, I like to remind audiences that we were the first economic engine in Canada, and, and actually uh, uh, it had major world implications. Remember that thing called the fur trade? Well, our people were the economic engine behind that, so we have a lot of um, uh, entrepreneurial spirit behind us, but because we've been on a forced hiatus for so long, we're just getting back to the table in the last couple decades. We still have some learning curves, getting access to capital to participate in, in, in a meaningful way, and resource development continues to be a challenge, business planning, uh, getting our, our people up to date when it comes to skills and training. Um, is also a challenge and industry wants to embrace that and the challenge is, is getting on the ground and building those relationships. Um, just two other quick little points before I pass on the mic. It's two things often when industry asks me, um, you know, what can we do as a sector or what can we do as a company to build relationships? And the one thing I say is, first you go into a community without an agenda, you sit down, go fishing, it's awesome. Go uh, do ceremony, go to powwows, whatever the community wants to do, just embrace that and then start to listen. And then start to realize that, recognize that there is a, an indigenous government there, but there's also community leaders that aren't in the government. And pay attention to who those leaders are because if you support their business aspirations, they're going to develop an economy in their community and they're going to be the ambassadors for your company as you support their business growth. And so that relationship starts at the grassroots. The other thing is that um, when we talk about companies and, and the embracing of our people into not only their frontline staff, not only into their managers, not only in their executives and their executive VPs, but also at the board level. There is a, a real challenge in Canada in that we look at our board structure, and no offense to anybody, it is pale, male, and stale. And I mean that with all due respect, but that's the truth. And if you look at the board structure, that is how it is. So how is that representative of the constituents or a country that is so multicultural? How is that going to build in the needs of communities and minorities? And you know, Canada is a big immigrating country. So embracing indigenous people at your highest levels within the board structure is also a one way, uh, a, a way to build business relationships. And just think about the impact that that has in the indigenous community if you go to the people and say, we have one of yours at the highest level of ours, and we're serious about building relationships. JP, before I ask you to pass the, the baton on, I, I, I want to just, I, I, what I said this to you in the green room is I, I do believe a significant amount of learning is going to happen both from the Canadian experience and the Australian experience. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about a constructive experience that a, a, 
it, a provincial government in Canada has done to help to facilitate this? And then could you also speak to anything in the last 20 years? It doesn't have to be the current Canadian government. It could be the current Canadian government, federal government. Could you talk about something constructive that you've seen done over time by the, the federal government in Canada? If you talk to, about either of those, just be with me for a second. Um, the federal government has, you know, for the longest time invested in uh, entrepreneurs. They've had some really strong programs like Aboriginal <coughs> Business Canada. It's supported for many years the business aspirations of, of our people across the country. It financed uh, 30 to 40, 50 percent of the startup of small businesses, which uh, contributed to the, remember that number I said, 30, or did, I'm not sure if I said it, 37,000 Aboriginal businesses across the country. So I think that did have a strong, um, very constructive piece. Unfortunately, the programs and the resources are starting to evaporate, and, and that's another story. That's right. From a provincial perspective, um, the provinces also understand that, that ping pong game that I've been talking about. So, uh, and the fiduciary responsibility, it's the federal government sort of been backing off on their programs. So the provinces are starting to pick up. They understand that if they invest in and co-invest with industry to um, uh, help train our people that they're uh, that, that that's going to be beneficial because then they get more of a tax base you get more projects going through then everybody starts getting taxed and it's good for the economy um, the one thing the highlight that I want to point out is that um, in Ontario just recently Premier Wynn and I'm a huge fan of her um, her government the provincial government in Ontario just uh, in the last six months or eight months ago had uh, delineated a billion dollars out of their budget to uh, for ro road infrastructure into the Ring of Fire, which is a major uh, potential for chromite, nickel, um, and so on up in northern Ontario, just actually north of my community. And I hope the federal government is going to be able to match that because industry is looking for um, security um, and support from government. and. And if, if the province steps up and the industry steps up and the community step, I think it's, uh, it's a really good uh, mixture for success. Thanks, JP. Okay. Thank you very much. James, thanks for coming all the way from Australia to be with us. <clears throat> um, now that, uh, what I was saying earlier to you in the, in the green room is, is that if, if we're going to have more infrastructure in the world, we're going to have more urbanization in the world, we're going to have more use of high technology in the world, we're going to have more cars in the world, then we're going to have more mining. And so the conversation we're having today is going to be more salient, not less salient. And success of companies to be very, having social license to operate success and having win-win relationships with commu local communities, especially and including indigenous communities, um, is going to have increased salience. So thanks for being here. Not at all. And, and thank you, Dan, for the invitation and uh, the opportunity to contribute to this very important discussion. Um, uh, from the perspective of a, a global resources company, the threshold question is why is this issue so important? Um, in the case of a company like BHP Billiton, many of the company's operations around the world, whether they be uh, in North or South America, Australia, uh, throughout the Asia Pacific, are either located on or adjacent to Indigenous people's lands. Sometimes those lands are formally recognised through legal and, and title processes. In other instances, there isn't formal recognition. Um, and because of the nature of the international resources sector, and particularly large companies like BHP Billiton, we're not fast-moving consumer goods companies in the sense of if you're a fast-moving consumer goods company and you blow your relationship with your host community or your host government, uh, you might be able to then you know, subcontract another, another factory in another country um, and move on. That's not the nature of the global resources sector. A company like BHP Billiton, when it makes an investment in a mining operation in any part of the world, generally that will involve tens of, millions of, tens of billions of dollars of capital investment and the company's presence will be anywhere between 80 and 120 years or longer. Mm. Now, what does that mean for how you uh, exercise your citizenship responsibilities as a responsible corporate actor? I think one of the things that it means is that particularly where your host communities are Indigenous communities, um, you have an opportunity to establish long-lasting relationships, in fact, intergenerational relationships with those communities. And those relationships are often a foundation stone to the sustainability of your operation. 
And you also have an opportunity through those relationships to bring about very significant change and improvement in people's lives through your presence and the way you engage and interact with them. Now, interestingly for, for BHP Billiton, this um, understanding of, of our role and this opportunity led to the company recently developing a specific Indigenous Peoples Policy Statement, which is now a, a public document on our website. And what that does is it, under, it articulates our understanding of Indigenous Peoples' experience around the world, where um, uh, often Indigenous Peoples have profound and very special connections to land, um, to, to waters, and that that's linked to their physical, their spiritual and economic well-being. And we also understand that in many parts of the world, Indigenous peoples uh, have suffered marginalisation and disadvantage and other forms of, of social exclusion. So acknowledging that reality and those dynamics as a company, the policy statement works to integrate the views and concerns of Indigenous peoples into our decision-making processes and our operating models. And there are three particular aspects that we believe, uh, as a responsible corporate citizen, we can contribute to uh, the benefit of Indigenous peoples from our presence. Those three aspects are economic empowerment, uh, social development needs and cultural wellbeing. So I'll just touch briefly on each of those. In terms of economic empowerment, um, Indigenous peoples in many parts of the world are now deriving very significant benefits from uh, advanced and, and leading practice uh, extractive industries operations. So they include uh, through procurement, through project equity, uh, through intergenerational trusts uh, that provide annuity streams uh, that last multiple generations. And some of those those arrangements are reflected in some of the, the operations that BHP Billiton now has in some parts of the world. So, for example, um, where there are opportunities for Indigenous peoples to become partners in the value creation aspects of, of our businesses, um, uh, we require our businesses around the world to develop uh, local procurement plans to purchase goods and services from local businesses, including Indigenous businesses, um, in, opera in, our, in operations where we are working with and adjacent to Indigenous communities in particular. Now, the scale of that investment for a, a company of this size can be quite significant. So in Australia alone, last financial year, in that 12-month period, the company purchased about $130 million worth of goods and services from Indigenous-owned and controlled enterprises just in Australia. So that's a significant economic contribution that the company can make. But procurement's just one avenue around economic empowerment. And uh, recently, um, uh, BHP Billiton, for example, in Canada signed opportunities agreements with five First Nations in Saskatoon. And that relates to their participation in our uh, Jensen Potash project. Those agreements, they create mutually beneficial opportunities across a range of domains. Employment, business development, community development and other areas. And as I said earlier, these operations often last many, many decades. So these can be sustainable long-term benefits. Um, interestingly, another aspect of uh, economic empowerment is an example is, is the company's work um, in a long-standing relationship with the Navajo Nation that's now endured, I think, for around 50 years. Um, the success of that relationship and the practices established through that relationship received recognition by the United Nations Global Compact recently and by the Harvard University through its Harvard project on American Indian economic development. Since that recognition, BHP Billiton and the Navajo Nation continue to work as, as very committed partners. And uh, there's an ongoing evolution of the relationship to a point where BHP Billiton recently transitioned the ownership of a mining operation to the Navajo Nation. So BHP Billiton moved from being the, the operator and then the employer um, to a position of being the employee of the nation from 2013. 
Um, and it's good to have Sam here, uh, who may have some, some reflections on, on that in particular. The second area I'll touch on briefly is around social development needs. Um, as I said earlier, Indigenous peoples in many parts of the world have, have suffered marginalisation. Um, and in many instances, uh, their needs and priorities haven't, haven't been adequately addressed. Um, and there's an opportunity here, I think, for responsible companies to make a contribution. So, for example, um, BHP Billiton uh, makes a commitment to invest 1% of its pre-tax profits in social programs around the world. Um, and last financial year, uh, the company invested somewhere around $13, $14 million in voluntary social investment projects specifically supporting Indigenous communities. They included a, a five-year uh, agreement uh, with Australia's um, uh, leading science body to increase interest and achievement in STEM, science, maths and engineering, for young Indigenous people throughout Australia. Um, and similar projects with other organisations around Indigenous education. And finally, in terms of, of those three pillars of our policy statement, cultural wellbeing. One of the things that we have noted as being very critical to the sustainability of our operations is, is our employees having an understanding of the context in which they're operating. So it's a mandatory requirement, for example, across all of our operations uh, where they are adjacent to or working on the lands of Indigenous peoples, for our employees uh, to undertake uh, cultural awareness and cross-cultural training. So in 2014 alone, we had more than 10,000 employees around the world undertake Indigenous cross-cultural training programs. Those programs are scaled in terms of those employees with the, the greatest daily or, or more prominent exposure to Indigenous peoples, um, having you know, more detailed and, and advanced cross-cultural training uh, through to those that have less frequent engagement. But that sort of investment around building our own employees' understanding we think is critical, um, as well as supporting the cultural needs and, and aspirations of Indigenous peoples themselves, um, whether through um, particular projects or, or initiatives. So in that context, um, uh, what we seek to achieve as an organisation is, through our policy statement, an aspiration to become a partner of choice for Indigenous peoples around the world wherever we operate, uh, and a partner of choice through which we s contribute to the economic empowerment, the social development needs and priorities, and the cultural wellbeing of Indigenous peoples wherever we're working around the world. So that's our contribution. Thank you. Thank you, James. Sam, uh, thank you for making the trip from New Mexico to be with us. <clears throat> You're the Business Development and Government Affairs Manager for the Navajo Transitional Energy Company. So I think you um, probably have some, some things to say about some of the comments that uh, Mr. Ensor made. Um, but also you might just share with us as well what, um, what, brings, you to, you know, what brings you to this conversation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the invitation. It is an honor to be here today. Uh, good morning. Yat e bine. My name is Sam Woods. Tachi in ancient I don't look at the name, but she's seen the Lizafane, the Shanalado, Tobahan, the Shache. Eight Adenest initially. It is customary to introduce, in my culture, it's customary to introduce myself and tell you about my family lineage. Uh, you never know I could have family who are in the audience today, and if so, uh, I think we should meet up after this, uh, pe this panel discussion because I think you're, you have to provide lunch and dinner and a, a place of uh, uh, a bid for me tonight. So, As Dan said, I've been working uh, for Intec for just over a year and a half now, and I support the, the uh, business from the genesis of, of business startup to the, to the current Intec business universe. A professor once said to me, Nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. It is that time that I introduced to you Navajo Transitional Energy Company, or Intec for short. Intec is a limited liability company wholly owned by the Navajo Nation that serves as, as an arm of the nation, or better said, it is an instrumentality of the, of the Navajo Nation to protect the nation's economic and financial best interests. As we say in Intec, 
Our success is not measured by how many years we've been in business or how much coal we sold. It's measured by the, it's measured by the quality of life which we have created for our people and also for our communities. We wear this brand <clears throat> on, our, on our arms to remind us of our ideals, our to serve rather than to re receive. When our leaders first envisioned the purchase of Navajo Mine, the financial and environmental health was of importance. Equally important were our stakeholders of the power plant and also the coal mine, and the ability to, and the ability to continue Navajo's core foundations of intellectual thought, of wisdom, and knowledge, undeniably to be more self-determined and self-sufficient. Intex mandates are simple. One, to further develop Navajo's financials and economy. Number two, protect, manage, and develop responsibility the nation's energy resources. Number three, invest no less than 10 percent of the net available profits into renewables or alternative energy systems. And last, number four, to further the nation's policies on economic development and to be more self-autonomous. Intech is a community that is comprised of other communities. If our communities are not successful, then Intech is not successful. Our engagements with these communities are vital for Intech's success to grow and foster partnerships. It is said in our own communities that our, it is said in our own communities that our communities raise our children, and we are a reflection of those communities. Indeed, our path forward for Intech is sustaining the region with life. We see Navajo coal sustaining that life by being the natural owner of Navajo mine. Our duties as, as a Navajo person are to respect and honor our sacred elements as they sustain Navajo life. It's no secret that coal is king on Navajo. Almost one-third of the revenues comes from fossil fuel extraction. The other two-thirds comes from the federal government uh, from in, in the form of federal grants. It's ironic to think that even grants from the U.S. comes directly or indirectly from resources, extraction in the form of royalties, taxes, dividends, or payments uh, to the U.S. government. Today, Intech manages Navajo Mine. Intech employs more than 340 full-time jobs. Nearly 83% of those jobs are Navajos. We see these jobs as careers, uh, that are built from the moment they take a position to an individual's journey uh, through learning, work, and other aspects of growth and life. In addition to those careers, the fuel source to supply more than 500,000 households throughout the Southwest comes from the Navajo Nation in the form of an abundant resource that we have. That affordable form of energy is Navajo coal. It protects the energy securities and demands of the Southwest communities. It is estimated that Navajo Mine and Four Corners Power Plant will bring in an income of over $1.8 billion to the Navajo Nation and $2.45 billion in, in a gross national product for the Navajo Nation. With maximizing our partnerships with BHP Billiton and Arizona Public Service Company, there was a sense of a win-win-win situation for all stakeholders involved in the creation of Intec. The buy-in and acceptance of the communities were also critical in the long-term economic sustainability of the Navajo Nation. The various levels of engagements in communities were also important during the early phases of, of Navajo ownership. Those same ideals and community engagements and community developments are more important to our business today. The Navajo Nation, like many states, remain concerned about the financial impacts of transitioning away from rich, fossil-dependent resources. However, it's a mandate that Intec, that Intec's goal is to diversify our dependence on fossil fuel and balance it with alternative sources. For every comp e even our even our company name embodies that vision with the word transitional. The transition of the nation's energy portfolio will change in time, but people often transition, but people often resist transition 
and therefore never, never allowing change as we continue to live in a state of cessation. Looking ahead for Intech requires being resilient and embracing the ever variability of change and market shifts, regulatory hurdles, and the socio-political environments that we live in today. Intech must adapt to adapt and condition against these changes and maximize its partnerships in delivering long-term positive values for our stakeholders and, and ensuring Navajo success and robust growth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, really appreciate you being here. E Emmanuel, thanks for coming all the way from New York Avenue to be with us. Sam, just turn off the, the microphone. Um, and we were talking before that 25 years ago, your job at the Inter-American Development Bank didn't exist. And then you said, well, maybe 20 years ago it did exist. And so I said, well, I hope you'll explain what is the Inter-American Development Bank and how come, how come the Board of Governors or the Board of Trustees of the Inter-American Development Bank created your job? And uh, I'm guessing that your inbox is growing with stuff in it as opposed to shrinking with stuff in it. So I'd be curious about that as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for the invitation. First, first, even if I'm coming from just across the corner, I think my role here is also to try to, to, to represent um, all the more the southern hemisphere into this debate, into this discussion, not only uh, the northern hemisphere. I mean, it's a bit remote. Just on the question you were asking also about why um, Board of Trustees being somebody like me, I think it, it probably will be better to ask them directly on that. But uh, I can try to respond um, to, to, to your other questions. Uh, first, what is the IDB? The IDB is an inter-American inter development bank. It's not, it's not the kind of a bank where you go to just take a loan for a house, or for a mortgage, or, or to get some, some cash. It's a development bank. We are there to finance development projects uh, in certain parts of the world, for us in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, our owners are actually more than 60 countries. The US is actually the largest shareholders with 30%, but we are, our majority of our shareholders are actually countries from Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, as I was mentioning, we finance development projects which can be education, which can be infrastructure, which can be roads, which can be uh, solar energy, which can be mining in certain cases. Uh, we provide loans to um, both the governments in the region, in the Latin American and Caribbean region, but also to the private sectors, uh, to company like BHP Billiton, for instance. Uh, why? Why is the extractive sectors, why is the issue of extractive sectors and, and just people matter to, to the IDB, matter to a development bank? First, because uh, the extractive sectors is a very important sector for Latin America and the Caribbean. It has been in the last decade uh, the largest engine, engine of growth in, in South America, particularly in countries like Colombia, Peru, Chile, uh, Guyana. So it's a very important sector for the development of South America. Uh, and these people on the other hand are a very important aspect of what any development institution can do in the region. Why? Because there are specific challenges and specific context in dealing with development in the context of uh, indigenous peoples. As, as um, James mentioned before, uh, indigenous people have, have suffered marginalization for, 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 for many decades, if not centuries. Uh, we are dealing with specific vulnerability, which relate also to an asymmetry of power there, which any form of development intervention need to address. Uh, we are also dealing with communities we have, as also Sam recalled just a few minutes ago, large attachment to land, territories, and natural resources. And, and 
that also a very important factors to be taken into account for any kind of project that may affect unjust peoples. So this issue of unjust peoples is so important that in 2007, we actually had our own policies. To be honest, we were not the first institution to have uh, an independent, uh, to have an indigenous people policy. I mean, the World Bank has, has, has one since the early 90s, uh, the, the end of the 90s. But because also at that time, something happened uh, on the international arena where, where this issue was actually recognized like a very important issue for the world. Um, some of you may know that uh, it was in 2006, 2007 that um, the United Nations adopted uh, the Declaration of the Right of Indigenous Peoples, which uh, enshrined some very important concepts like free, pre or informed consent for indigenous peoples. So it, it was a very important time that time. And, and on, on the IDB, it was also the time where we, we formally adopted our indigenous people policies. Uh, this policy, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but I think it's really based on, on the vision of development with identity. That's the key, the key aspect of, of, of this policy. Recognizing um, the vulnerability and the specific identity of indigenous peoples, uh, which has certain consequences, certain implications for any, any form of uh, economic development intervention you want to have, uh, in the context of uh, of, uh, of indigenous peoples, uh, one of the this key principle is really respecting and preserv preserving the indigenous people cultural, economic, and governance uh, identity. As was mentioned before, um, what we think, what we see as development and well-being, may not be exactly what the indigenous community see as development and well-being. And therefore, we have to recognize this, um, this um, different, sometimes different, uh, view of the world and, and incorporate it into any form of benefits, any form of partnership we want to have with those peoples. A very important aspect to be able to achieve that is actually uh, consultation, what we called in our policy good faith negotiation to understand how indigenous people see the world, see their own benefits, and what they want to have as benefits. We have also incorporated into our policy what is now recognized as free, pre, or informed consent for certain cases which may uh, significantly affect uh, the physical or territorial integrity of indigenous peoples. And also, last last part, which was also talked by, by GP James and Sam before, is how we ensure participation of indigenous people in project benefits. And, and, and I was very impressed by, by, by his example of GP in Canada. I think, uh, obviously, you guys are far, far ahead of, of what we have in, in other countries here, uh, particularly in the, in the southern hemisphere. But, but this is something we are, we are, we are working. Finally, I'd just like to, to, to share with you, I probably won't have the time to go very much in details, but from beyond those principles I was mentioning, a real world experience we had in Peru, a project we financed in, in 2003. It's an interesting project because first, it's a very important project for with Peru. It's a Camisa project where we have, uh, which had changed the economy of Peru by providing uh, a lot of uh, a lot of revenue for Peru. It's gas um, operate, uh, extraction and transport. I mean, gas operate, uh, extraction in in the middle of the Amazon in Peru and and uh, and, uh, and transport for domestic consumption and, and export. Uh, and it was a very, very controversial project for, for, for the bank to finance. And again, I was mentioning our policy dates from 2007. This project was financed in 2003. So it's not a perfect project. It's not a project that by which we buy to the letter of our policy, which came afterwards. But it has been really a defining moment for the bank to define its policy in terms of anxious peoples. And, and, and just we have now celebrated more than 10 years of, of, uh, of operation of Camisia. And I just want to share with you quickly the key lesson learned we have from, 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 the, from this project. 
in terms of extractive industries dealing with indigenous peoples. Uh, what we found very important, and for us, probably one of the key reasons why this project was possible, was really trying to avoid impact. Impacting land, territories, natural resources for indigenous people. And, and for this project, which was located in a very uh, sensitive environment like, like the Amazon region, the model that has been followed by, by, the, by the companies implementing the project is what we called um, offshore inland model, which is basically developing these activities as if they were offshore, as if you were in the middle of the ocean. And, but instead, you are in the middle of the forest. Uh, no access roads. All transport has been done by helicopter. Um, limited the footprint of any time of installation. Uh, installation. I, I'm not going to go in, into many detail at this point, but basically, everybody recognized that this model of really limiting the environmental impact was key in making getting to the social life and to the social acceptance of this project for by, by, by communities in general and just people community in, in, in particular. As uh, James mentioned before, long-term relationship is absolutely key. And, and what we saw through this project is was the importance of building trust uh, through ongoing consultation, not just before you do the project, but including the overall life of the project. And, and one interesting experience has been what we call participatory monitoring, which is basically empowering the indigenous community to do the monitoring of the project themselves. Basically, uh, some form of empowerment here, uh, and also an important array, uh, uh, a factor for them to gain trust in the project, um, actually delivering their commitments. And another important area of or factor for success here has been uh, partnering at different level, not just with the companies. Governments, central, local, have a role to play here. Uh, the, part the partnership cannot be, um, particularly in country like Peru, I mean, when we are not dealing with Canada, Canada, Australia, the US, it, it's very important that governments uh, retain a role in, um, in strengthening uh, the protection of indigenous people there. And, and that's something we personally, I mean, we as, as an institution help to build with uh, partnering with the government to have what we call the 21 commitment to strengthen the position of indigenous people in this region into the country also. It was, it was a very important outcome of the project. I didn't say that. We also recognize that something didn't work. And, and Two examples I want to mention here, it's, it's also the lack of capacity of the local government and central government. Unfortunately, it means that the benefits that were expected for the, uh, for, for the indigenous community didn't really trickle down to them. And, and when you're dealing with in country like Peru, Colombia, of the southern hemisphere, where the local government doesn't necessarily have a very strong capacity to deliver benefits to very remote regions. It's very important to think about what should be the role of the private sectors in being able to deliver those benefits too. And and also something we are we are watching and that was briefly touched upon by Dan in his introduction is the fact that we see also the arrive, arrival of new actors into the same area of Camellia, we have seen Chinese company, for instance, coming right now. And they are not necessarily going to implement the uh, offshore inland model. And that strengthens a little bit all the benefits we see have been accrued for the 10 years of, of, of the working of the Camellia model. So uh, us as a development bank, or the government of Peru, or other the private sector also, how we can try to work together to establish some minimum understanding of what any companies coming into the situation should, should, be, should be doing. It's also something we are interested in discussing with everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, JP had a two finger and since he's come all the way from Canada, I'm happy to oblige. JP. Okay, really quickly. Um, 
just after reflecting a little bit on, on my fellow panelists, um, there's a way we can uh, deal with um, uh, actors out on the landscape, either with a, a carrot or a stick. I'm very much a carrot type of person. We've got a program within the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business called PAR. Now, don't get too excited. I know it's golf season, but it stands <laughs> for Progressive Aboriginal Relations. And this program, what it does is it helps companies um, build and or think strategically and actually align their, 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 their practices in building good relationships, progressive relationships with Indigenous people. And it, does, uh, it helps companies um, improve their relations in, in four pillars, employment, engagement, investment, and business support or, uh, or, or, or procurement. Um, and, and really, it's not political. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a program to help uh, build that relationship. It's, uh, you know, we've talked about FPIC, you know, and uh, the free prior informed consent is starting to be raised in a lot of uh, countries. Um, I think it's a really great precursor uh, to FPIC. I think it's an opportunity to solidify a relationship so that FPIC doesn't even have to be talked about. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an, an invaluable tool. So I'd like to thank you. share that. Thank you, JP. Thank you very much. Um, there's some very thoughtful and knowledgeable people in the room, and I want to take advantage of their presence here. So I'm going to start the questions, and we're going to do this World Bank style. So I'm going to bunch several questions together. I want to hear from my friend Rebecca Adamson, who's with First Peoples, has come all the way from Fredericksburg, Virginia. Thanks for being here. Thanks. I want to hear from Rebecca. I want to hear from my friend Gustavo Arnavad, who's the former U.S. Executive Director at the Inter-American Development Bank. And I also want to hear from my friend Veronica Kohler, who's with the National Mining Association. So, But I'm going to start with Rebecca. So if you could bring the microphone to my, my friend Rebecca over here. Well, thank you, Dan, and thank you very much, um, panelists. I enjoyed the panel this morning, and I'm glad to be here. And we had JP at one of our events, and it's just good to see him back and glad to be here. Uh, we've served as non-technical risk advisors for a number of corporations, uh, Rio Tinto, Valet, uh, OMV, um, um, Hess, and in that capacity, uh, we've talked to them about achieving a social license to operate with indigenous peoples. We're also a bit schizophrenic. I'd like to say uh, bifurcated, but I think it's more schizophrenic in that we work very, very directly with indigenous groups uh, in a grassroots sense. We make small grants to communities around the world. We're in 60 countries right now. Uh, one third of our small grant portfolio is going to communities that have never, ever, ever had money before. Uh, and I bring that up because there's many communities where a corporation is going to be working where that capacity is non-existent. The capacity you have on this panel is brilliant. And if companies had an indigenous people's policy that was able to take what you learn in Canada, what you learn from the Navajos, and make it corporate wide, uh, would be the first recommendation. But, but the other recommendation is when you're out there and you're working in communities without capacity, I kind of want to flip it and talk about something else we're doing, and it has to do with corporate capacity. And what's the corporation's capacity for genuine engagement? Um, we work very directly, like I said, with grassroots communities and with investors. That's why I said schizophrenic. It's not bifurcated. It's totally schizophrenic when you're working with that kind of combination. And with the investors, what we're really doing is looking at how to assess a corporation's capacity to manage and mitigate its social risk, plain and simple. And we've been looking at a metrics now that is taking a full-on hardcore measurement of a capacity for a corporation to mitigate its social risk. And one of the things we're finding, for example, is you operate with suboptimal data. Uh, in one capacity of the non-technical risk advisor, I was asked to review the Greenland uh, Social Environmental Impact Assessment Report. Uh, 450 pages. Uh, uh, SEIA, you probably have all read them if you're from a corporation, on Greenland. Greenland is 85 percent Inuit, 450 pages, and it was never mentioned. There was no mention of indigenous peoples and the Inuit culture until the last chapter, which was 10 pages long, which brought the Inuit people in, and they said they need education, and there's probably not much we could do right now. I gave a lot of advice to that company and said, they kept saying, but the parliament approved it, the parliament approved it. And we kept saying, you're required for broad-based community support. Your SEIA is not giving you the kind of optimal information you need because you're not in the villages and you don't really know what the villages want and that's where you're gonna be laying your pipeline. Um, 
needless to say, Parliament got reelected. I mean, actually, Parliament got wiped out the next election, and they put in anti-development people. This is where a corporation could have been in there, could have been on the ground with optimal information. They'd have been able to read those signs instead of getting flat-footed and blindsided with the fact that now Parliament doesn't want any development. You know, there's ways that we need to look at how corporate, and what we've seen in our measurements is that a company that can mitigate its social risk actually has higher economic performance. And on average, the economic performance was what, 5.6% higher return on investment? Uh, it went as widely as 11% uh, more return on investment for those companies that could not manage their social risk. Uh, so that there's metrics out there, and I think there's a capacity that companies need to look at uh, as to how they engage. Thanks, Rebecca. Gustavo, I suspect you had to deal with this on a fairly frequent basis. There's a microphone over there. That in, and your role as a former, when you were U.S. Executive Director at the IDB. Right. Thank you, Dan. I think you asked uh, Emmanuel why the Board of Executive Directors would hire someone like him, so I thought I would provide the answer. Uh, <laughs> So as, the, as Latin America has become more and more democratic, certainly over the last 20 or 30 years, the role of all stakeholders, all citizens, all residents in a particular country uh, has become more and more important, and therefore the need to address uh, you know, their, their, their needs and their demands. Uh, you know, without the kind of work that Manuel does, the kind of policies that the IDB and others have implemented, we simply, at this day, you know, could not get those done. For practical matters, it wouldn't be, be able to, we couldn't do it locally, to be very frank, uh, politically speaking, it would be very difficult for the United States uh, to provide the kind of funding that it does to multilateral institutions. So everyone wins. It's, you know, the, the indigenous communities win, the governments win, the IDB wins. However, uh, these policies, uh, regardless of how well intended they are, are implemented by human beings and not by God. And so for a variety of different reasons at the implementation level, there will be differences as to whether or not various policies are being implemented in the correct fashion, uh, and, and, or they're being implemented in ways that adversely affect indigenous communities uh, and, and in contrary to those policies. The challenge has been for many years, and I saw this firsthand, uh, when we have to come up with a mechanism that's supposed to be independent, that's supposed to provide for consultations, provide, supposed to provide for investigations to see who's right. And ultimately, of course, the, the, the board of executive directors, although they report to the board of governors, uh, believes itself to be sovereign. At the IDB, we have an interesting uh, governance issue, which is that the borrowing countries collectively control slightly more than the majority. I think for good reasons, but then there are also that creates challenges. And one of those challenges on a practical level is that whenever a project is challenged, the director for that particular country understandably takes on the role of advocate uh, in challenging any findings by any kind of you know, independent uh, mechanism. Uh, much like I have to say, if ever I was on the board and the U.S. Treasury or the U.S. government was challenged in some way, the last thing I was going to do was to say, I agree with you. <laughs> We're wrong. <laughs> so, uh, and so uh, I'm just being you know, very practical. And so that's always been the challenge. I think will continue to be the challenge. Having said all that, we're talking now at the margins uh, because I am convinced that the vast majority of the projects are being done in an appropriate fashion and because of the work that Emmanuel and some of his colleagues do, uh, I think that we've addressed you know, these issues uh, in, in a way that you know, we're doing so now in a way that we didn't do probably 30 years ago or so. And so on balance, you know, I think they should get a very good grade for what they've done. Thank you. Veronica. Thank you, and thank you to the panelists. It was um, very interesting presentations. Um, it's great to hear what BHP is doing. and, and I appreciate you know, a company that's forward thinking and working on social and developmental issues and working within communities. I think over the past 20 years, a lot of good actors have come out of the woodwork in the extractive sector. And I think it's now our responsibility to raise awareness about what those good actors are doing to incentivize other companies in the sector to raise their own bars to that level. And that can be all of our responsibility, not just the companies who are actually um, moving that bar up because it, it's in everyone's best interest to have the entire sector um, have the same positive impact in the communities in which they're operating. And as Rebecca mentioned, there are economic reasons for 
um, corporate and social responsibility changing and being mainstreamed through a company and helping us develop um, a business case to articulate and help other companies um, reach that goal as well, I think would behoove all of us. And it's not just the private sector and the community partnerships that I think are important and necessary for success, but it's the public, I mean, it's the government as well participating in this and partnering with private and then with communities. There are a lot of things that companies can't do if the government isn't open to um, extraction or operations in certain areas or in their national boundaries. And then we don't want to leave out the investors. And so I'm glad to see that IDB is here. And obviously, you know, IFC has been working in the extractive <laughs> sectors and, and identifying principles to help raise the bar. But there are other investors out there that could be brought into this conversation um, that would help, again, raise the bar. Those folks to respond to some of the comments that we're hearing. Sure. Um, to Rebecca's comments, I, uh, I fully agree. Um, when we start building in what that means to your bottom line, if you're not building relationships and business relationships, they have significant impacts. And I just reflect again on, on our PAR program. It's been around for almost 14, well, 15 years now, and we have oil and gas, forestry, mining, finances, all sorts of companies have gone through that. And I just want to reflect when Suncor Energy became PAR Silver Certified within our organization, the Financial Times came out with a just a one-liner, Suncor Energy receives PAR Silver Certification within CCAB's program. And what that says is that finance is obviously paying attention. If you're not checking off your boxes, and I hate to say it so crudely, but if you're not actually working and spending time in developing relationships with, in, with Indigenous people, your products are at risk. And risky projects, money becomes more sparse and more expensive. So absolutely, right on the head. Um, I think the other comments around, um, um, uh, oh geez, I just lost my train of thought. I do apologize. That's okay. um, but again, it, you know, uh, largely it gets down to the bottom line of a lot of these companies. And, and, but the thing is that Indigenous communities, as we're starting to hear, can add. Oh, I remember what it was. And to your point about um, it's just not the, the primary um, resource extraction, the big company's responsibility. It's, like you say, it's everybody's responsibility. So how are we going to influence the whole supply chain to think about out, getting outside of the regular practices of hiring and the procurement and the hiring of Aboriginal people or Indigenous people? How are we going to incentivize or, and I'm not a stick guy, but how are we going to punish those that don't? How are we going to get the whole value chain pushing in the same direction? Because ultimately, we all benefit when we do that. James. Uh, the, the observations really hit a chord with me. Um, and I think, I, going to uh, Rebecca's observations, I think I partially agree with those. And, and just let me explain a, a little bit. So um, risk mitigation. Um, as an approach. Is it necessary? Absolutely. Is it sufficient? In my view, no. Um, and by that I mean uh, organisations, if you, if, you, if you look at you know, typical approaches around risk mitigation frameworks, so for, for a company like BHP Billiton, it's mandatory for every operation that the company operates around the world to have regular, independently conducted human rights impact assessments social baseline assessments, community development management plans. Um, these are mandatory deal breakers. And it's a compliance based model. Those, those processes, they, they uh, produce voluminous documents and, and plans and, and such like. And they're necessary, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not of the view that they are sufficient. And I think it goes to, to, to JP's observation that, that at the end of the day, there's no substitute for hiring people who have the capacity to build relationships, to be open, to build understanding, operate in, in cross-cultural contexts, um, and people with, with personal integrity in terms of how they manage relationships. And I think uh, uh, to, to realise the full potential of, of relationships and and the benefits that resource extraction can can bring to indigenous peoples it's putting those two pieces of the jigsaw together so having 
a culture, an enabling culture within a corporate entity that moves beyond uh, a compliance and risk mitigation framework to, to embedding in, in cultural norms and attitudes and behaviours and expectations of an entire workforce, particular understandings and, and models. So one of the pieces of advice that I often give to, to staff working in these sorts of roles is put yourself in the place of the Indigenous community or the Indigenous leader that you are working with. How would you expect to, to be treated if you had their history, their experience, and they would, and you were, were work, walking in your shoes? And just to reflect on that in your day-to-day -day interactions and how you plan and how you work with those stakeholders. So yes, this, uh, the, the, the sort of compliance and risk mitigation approach, I think, is, is absolutely necessary. But there's something more fundamental, I think, that, that also needs to accompany that. Yeah, thank you. Sam. I also agree with James. Um, the Navajo Transitional Energy Company, or, or the Navajo Nation, it's, is a sm we're, we're still a developing nation. Uh, most people, when we, when we do these talks about who we are, where we come from, and we, we start talking about a small nation inside the United States nation, it's somewhat of a nation within a nation, but um, it's all the things, everything that we're engaged in from, from, the, from the business level to the, the engagements to uh, the policies to uh, re uh, regulatory and compliance, um, everything that we're engaged in, I think we're, we're just now stepping into those, those different arenas or those, those different areas and we're learning. Um, we're, we're, we're learning as a nation to be, uh, to be in, you know, just for from Intex perspective, perspective is that we're we're, we're understanding this business, um, BHP and others, and uh, uh, the companies that we we engage with on a daily daily basis. They've been in this industry for for a number of years. Um, for us to take over Navajo Mine, and we're you know somewhat of of, of, of a newbie in trying to understand how they've been running th these operations for years and years. So for us, again, we, we go back to uh, building internal capacity, ensuring that our partners uh, provide the necessary, the, the necessary uh, capacity to build ourselves up to manage and run these, these, these operations. Um, and again, I, I, did, I did talk about uh, to be successful, I think, in, and I did say that Intec is a community that is comprised of a lot of different uh, other communities. And some of those communities are your grassroots folks. Um, in our com in, for, for where I come from, from the Navajo Nation, we have a lot of different grassroots organizations, um, and that someone, some of them are are always for what we're doing, and some are always against for what we're what we're what we're trying to achieve. And the bottom line is really sustaining uh, sustaining the current jobs and and building building our, our revenues because a lot of our revenues are used to um, that actually go back to the communities and actually go back to the people in the form of direct services helping our youth helping our elders helping our community building our communities so and and we do we do for us we, we do see it as uh, gaining acceptance from those grassroots organizations of those communities and and again it re refers back to having this social license to operate and that's somewhat as uh, in terms of in a way of, as how we see it. So, thank you. Okay, Emmanuel. Thank you. I'd just like to, to emphasize in, uh, the idea that was um, proposed of, of, of recommended and how we can get to a coalition of various actors to, to move uh, on, on those issues. And, and first, as I mentioned, it's very important that the partnership be not only between the companies and the indigenous peoples, but between the companies, the indigenous peoples, and the government, because government do have a role to play here. It's, it's complicated sometimes, but um, leaving the government out, some form of, I mean, either central or 
local government w w usually not leading necessarily to very good outcomes at the end. In terms of the industry specifically, uh, I I'd just like to, to, to take an example of what happened on, from the uh, extractive sectors on the biodiversity issue a few years ago. Because the extractive sectors had, some, had to deal with this um, specific issue also of biodiversity, they created what was called the BBOP, the Business Biodiversity Offset Principles. Uh, it was not restricted to the extractive sectors, but the extractive sector was very strong in it. And, and it, it was an opportunity for the leaders of, of the sectors to basically um, uh, propose something for the overall sectors. Of course, all industries are not necessarily joining that. But uh, it does give an opportunity uh, for the one on the sectors who are actually acting uh, in the leadership on, on those issues uh, as a platform and, and, and a platform of change. So I mean, that also something that could be interesting if this issue is moving uh, forward uh, more prominently would be to see how the sectors can could organize itself uh, so that very, uh, I mean, leaders like uh, BHP Billiton could, could move into that direction and propose form of a framework that would be applicable to a coalition of companies. Because they are actually between the donors, principles, probably you policy, other policy, I think there are a lot of commonalities. I'd like to hear from Tom Outlaw and Andrew Mack. Tom, explain why, why I'm calling on you. Sure. Because I'm pale male, but definitely not stale. <laughs> that is absolutely the case, yes, yes. Um, now with uh, USAID uh, in the Partnerships Division, uh, but formerly uh, just returned from Madagascar where I worked um, for a mining, Canadian mining company, uh, Share It International, which ironically happened to be the, Canada's largest thermal coal producer at the same time as one of the world's largest uh, proprietary processes for nickel mining. Um, hats off to Dan again for a great presentation, which to me is really at the sweet spot of what I'm being paid at AID to do, so very useful podium for me. Um, I just want to make one observation based on what Gasawa said and maybe turn this sow's ear into a silk purse here. Whenever I'm on a panel discussion about extractives in Africa, it's always resource curse, corrupt governments, fiscal regimes, bank accounts we don't know about, that kind of stuff. Whenever I'm on a panel, to a panel and to a person on a Latin American discussion, it is always about indigenous rights and the environment. Now, obviously Africa's got plenty of indigenous peoples, right? So what's the diff? If it is true what you just said, that these countries are advanced enough on the development spectrum that these organizations both have the ability, uh, the technical skills, and the, the government you know, leeway to make a ruckus about these things, maybe that's in some ways a sign of progress. Um, you know, we were operating a, a strip mine in the heart of the world's probably most endangered rainforest in Madagascar. Um, that was a focus of some of our issues, but it was mainly dealing with a corrupt coup regime, and everyone was convinced that we were paying money under the table, even though as Canadians, except I was a lone American, we really tried to be more Catholic than the Pope on that. Um, one thing I wanted to make, mention about the, the difficulty of social license and just how fleeting it can be is, at the same time in Canada, we were divesting ourselves of our coal assets. And we were basically redefining what the company was about and focusing on mining in Madagascar. We were winning sustainability, community relations, awards hand over fist. We had the director of UNAIDS get on a plane from Geneva and fly down to give us an award for our HIV testing program. And I remember very clearly because we were getting, at, at, and at the same time, I can't remember what the order of events was, but either but just before or just after we sold the asset, we had a, a in Canada, in uh, Hinton, about I don't know how many miles due west of uh, Edmonton in Alberta, a breach of the coal mine um, slurry pond. It dumped about 200 million gallons of arsenic, cadmium, manganese, just a cocktail of death uh, into the watershed. And needless to say, that created quite a bit of consternation among the First Nations peoples uh, there. 
and phones rang, and stock prices plunged, and headlines ran. Um, at the same time, we were doing everything we could to operate in a sustainable and community-friendly way in Madagascar, and it was working. Uh, but we were uh, getting in the motorcade with the French ambassador to commission a technical school that we had funded in cooperation with uh, uh, AFD. And the ambassador's in the car, and he shows me his Blackberry, Sacre Bleu, Encoyable, Qu'est-ce que se passe? This story. And literally, as the wheels were rolling, he was not going to get on the podium with us after this had been months in the making. And, you know, we basically had to convince him, look, Ambassador, this is a global company, but you've seen what we do here on the ground. You know we do good work. I can't speak to what's happening here, but I know we're dealing with it. We finally talked him off the ledge, and the event went forward. But, you know, if that had happened, that would have made it the BBC, when the French ambassador steps out of Madagascar at his front page news. And so as hard as we were working in Madagascar, a slip up in another part for a global operation can sink the whole thing. I don't know what the lesson from that is, other than the necessity of at a corporate C-suite level, rigorous policy, strong enforcement, consistent principles, and uh, very network communication. Um, last but not least, I just wanted to underscore the point that Dan and James were both making. Um, you know, these guys... Sorry, that we're all not stale? Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> yeah, the not stale part, we all know that. But. Um, you, extractive industries are, by definition, as, as Dan said, just from the CapEx alone, long-term investors. And one of the great uh, epiphanies that I had moving from USAID into the, the mining business is, you know, we were there with a 30-year project, and we didn't even pay off the senior debt holders until, like, year 14. So there's no pulling up stakes. We're not going to go anywhere. So we are, by definition, the interest alignment is almost perfect because these organizations, like them or not, have to work with these communities. They ignore them at their peril. And when I go to AID and promote partnerships, I get the same, oh, not these guys again, they're not good. That's really not the point, whether their heart is in it or not. That's not the question. The question is, what opportunity do they pose for partnership, and what is their interest alignment with the goals of the development agency? And to me, it's almost one-to-one. -one. Andrew you. Mack. Thanks, Dan, and thanks a lot, Tom, for having stolen my good line about pale and male. Um, uh, so uh, Dan called on me because he wanted me to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've, we've done with extractives and natural resource companies, so I'll make some reference to that. Both in Latin America and Africa, we've had some really good and interesting experience. Uh, when it, when, from what we've seen, it, a lot of it comes down to two issues. One of them is environment, and the other one is jobs. Environment, because we know that extractives are, by their nature, very tricky, and at the very minimum, we need to be seen as being sensitive around environmental issues, around land stewardship issues. If we're not, it really doesn't make a difference how many awards we win. It doesn't make a difference whether the guy from UNAIDS thinks that we are you know, the, the second coming of some wonderful being. It really doesn't matter at all. Uh, I think that those kinds of those kinds of honorifics are fantastic and they're worth shooting for, but they don't last in the long term. So definitely, in being in touch with the environmental and the the connection to land that indigenous people have is supremely important. The second thing I think is in some ways at least as important, which is the question of jobs. And uh, James mentioned the 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 amount of supply chain jobs that were being created. That's good and that's relatively new from what we've seen over the course of time. When we started working in Africa, you know, 10 years ago on this issue, there wasn't much of a consideration of trying to hire locals or help to stand up local, local uh, and, 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 and incapacitate local businesses to make those long-term commitments. But the truth of the matter is, is that you are, despite your tremendous importance and tremendous power as speaking now as, 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 as parts of the, uh, the uh, natural resources uh, food chain, you're just one part of a community's life. And one of the big questions that we're trying to figure out is how can we take that partnership? You don't want to employ everybody in a region, even if it were possible to do so, and even if there were good jobs. It's too much pressure on any one sector. It's too much pressure on any one company. And frankly, it's not, it's not good business practice. And so what can we, as, a, as, as, major, as major stakeholders in a community, what can we do to build up other sources diversify other, other sources of, 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 of job growth, because jobs is the second big piece. If you look around the world in indigenous communities, the lack of jobs is a really, really big issue. 
the lack of long-term jobs, the lack of abilities for, for entrepreneurship. And uh, so whether it's working on micro-franchising or whether it's working to bring in other major companies that you might have access to, or whether it's the trying, to, trying to mobilize resources from a combination of public and private with using, using some government sources, those strike me as a really, really important way to go. And I'd love to know uh, what, if anything, you think has been successful in this space since we've seen a lot of efforts and a lot of swings and misses, if you'll pardon a baseball in reference. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to just go down the row here. I'd like people to, res to respond to any of the reflections and observations that you heard, as well as uh, last comments from each of the panels. JP, the floor is yours. I want to go last. Fine. Sure. Again, some, some very pertinent yeah. observations. <laughs> on, on the question of, of uh, jobs and, and contribution, there's, there's a few things, I think, that are important here. The, the first is um, for large extractive industries companies, um, uh, the way I'd like to, to uh, interpret things is these companies are significant national development actors in many contexts in which they work, um, in many of the countries in which uh, the HP Billiton has operations, it can be one of the largest direct employers in that country, it can be one of the largest taxpayers in that country through its contributions of taxes and royalties. Its supply chain can have you know, quite significant reach throughout a national economy. So it's not just thinking in terms of your economic contribution through local employment, it's about conceptualising you know, your role as a material national economic actor, as I say, over a long period of time, not over a short period of time. Um, so how can a company, in terms of how a company positions itself in terms of working with governments, working at the interface between governments and, and communities and civil society, <coughs> and also not inadvertently making um, you know, significant mistakes. So, so by way of example, you know, the resources sector, it's a cyclical sector by its very nature um, in, in terms of it being the outcome of demand and price being the determinant of, of the outcome of supply and demand changes over time. So we've recently been through a global resources boom. Um, we're now going through um, another period um, towards a sort of bottom of cycle and, and perhaps in you know three or four or five years in a number of commodity areas that cycle will will turn up again so thinking about your approach as a significant national economic development actor is really critical and recognizing what you can do what's beyond your control to do but how you might be able to influence others becomes very important so for example in, in South America, some of the most interesting initiatives I've, I've seen um, uh, recently um, in projects that BHP Villitans had an association with um, have been uh, the sponsoring of uh, what we've called um, uh, citizen platforms, where the company is a significant national economic development actor in, in a particular country, um, has uh, worked with national and provincial governments uh, to create platforms that bring together uh, representatives of, of uh, communities uh, with provincial and national governments to co-determine their priorities and needs at a local level or a provincial level and then to work in a tripartite way between the, the company, different levels of government and communities to match you know, resource contributions uh, to communi agreed community priorities and needs. So not creating a situation where, you know, a company inadvertently could become, you know, a de facto government and, and replace the role of, of government which is inappropriate. So it's those sorts of things we need to think about. We need to, to have to take a sort of systems approach and not just think about, you know, the particular mine site and how it interacts just with our local community. That's important, but it's not, it's not necessarily sufficient. Sam. 
In, in terms of the jobs, it doesn't make sense to employ everyone. In our case, coming from Navajo, we have a high unemployment rate. It, it's roughly about 51, 52 percent. And being that we were just over 300,000 people and roughly about a, uh, 180,000 of those people live on the Navajo Nation and 51, 52 percent of those people are unemployed. And it does make sense, I guess, from, from our perspective to employ uh, as many Navajos as we possibly can. Because as, as James said, said this, it's cyclical because if you employ a Navajo person, uh, the person provides a good quality work, a good quality product, and productivity increases. The company, when productivity increases, the company does well. When the company does well, the company does creates profits, uh, and the company pays back dividends back to the government, back to the communities, and even even the even the uh, the productive worker, uh, the pay back in form of uh, taxes back to the communities and back to the government. So in a sense, it's somewhat of a whole win-win situation for everyone. Um, and again, back to Navajo, uh, we have such an abundant uh, amount of resources on Navajo. As, as I said, we, coal is king on Navajo. We have roughly about 42.2 billion tons of coal in a Navajo nation. So. Right now, we're looking into whether we need to utilize uh, more of that, more of those coal resources with the technologies that do exist out there to create um, other revenue generating um, uh, businesses for the Navajo Nation. Um, we also do have uh, an oil and gas company. We have an uh, engineering and construction company. We have a, a numerous other different uh, Organizations that employ Navajo people, and again, um, with with maximizing our partnerships with you know, with uh, companies like BHP Built and uh, Peabody Energy and and other big known companies that do work on the Navajo Nation, it is it's good to leverage those those companies and to help us understand the, the, the resources that we have on Navajo and build those resources and develop those resources for really for the benefit of, of our people and also for our communities. Emmanuel? <coughs> I, I think all the intervention reflect very clearly the challenges, opportunity we have. Just on the last intervention, uh, environment, I, I couldn't agree more on jobs. I think jobs is just one very important but specific aspect of participation into the project benefits. And I think we need to think a little bit more about what that means, participation in project benefits. Uh, there are also community development. There is the um, example of Canada, which I think is very interesting too. So uh, job is, is important, but I think we need to think a little bit broader also in terms of benefit sharing. Okay, JP, you really do have the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with regards to the unfortunate spill left uh, in Alberta, uh, one of the things um, that I advocate a lot for is building in indigenous, indi building in indigenous people into the whole process. I uh, often I ask, well, how do you incorporate traditional knowledge into Western science? Um, it's a slightly colonialistic view if you take that view, but about building indigenous people into your process and your mitigation process and everything. Uh, so in essence, you've got validators. It doesn't answer all your, so that's a significant challenge that you described. I, I don't pretend to have a silver bullet for that, but that's one element that I think that you can, companies can use to, to help address some of those uh, environmental impacts that, that, that do occur every once in a while, unfortunately. Uh, with regards to jobs, um, Again, back to my point about the whole supply chain, you need really strong procurement policies that you need to walk, um, but you also need to make sure that your suppliers also have those same uh, procurement strategies for, for, for employment and, 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 and um, uh, procurement of Aboriginal or in, in the Indigenous businesses. Uh, again, you know, you, you, there's, your need for goods and services is significant, and you're going to be a major driver of that economy um, so make sure every aspect of that economy is thinking about this as well. So in, ensuring that you've got internal policies and, and on your scorecards when you're, if, if you can't find an indigenous business, supply you the good or service, make sure that they've got the strong uh, procurement policies in their practices as well is really important. 
Um, and just make sure your procurement has teeth. One of the, back to the Canadian government, one thing that um, uh, irks me a little bit is in the U.S. you've got such strong government procurement policies here. In Canada, we don't have that. There's, it's a nice thing to do, but thing, these, these policies have to have teeth, otherwise industry or other governments, they're, they're just not going to invest. Okay, on that note, we're gonna, we're gonna end. Please join me in thanking the panel.